I'd like to share some thoughts with you tonight, young people. Uh, I, I thoroughly enjoy talking to the young people of the church, mainly because I still consider myself one of you. We have our requisite senior citizens here tonight, and we appreciate these good brethren being with us. <laughs> I can do that, because I'll probably never see you again. <laughs> but I, I like to talk to the young people, because I feel what you feel and what you're perhaps going through. This talks about who we are and who we can become if we catch the vision of really who we are and why we're here now. This is a true story. Eagles, and it, eagles are a fascinating bird to me, but when an eagle builds its nest, it builds a very large nest and it goes very high, high tree and a high mountain or a cliff, and it builds a wide nest, and these nests are sometimes four and five feet across. Some eagles have wingspans of eight feet. They're a big, magnificent bird. Only the nest the eagle builds is a little different from most birds. It takes long, sharp sticks. And it weaves these sticks together so they all poke up. So that all around this nest, if you look at the foundation of it, you find these sharp sticks. And after it has the base built, then it flies out and it gets leaves and feathers and grass, and it brings it back and weaves it into these sticks. So the feathers and the down, if you will, come up above the sharp stick. Well, then the eagle lays the egg, or two eggs, and maybe one or two eaglets will survive. And these two eaglets break out of the, the egg, and here they find themselves in this soft, magnificent place. And mom goes out every day and brings back food, and they don't have to worry about anything but food. And it comes back and... As the eaglet grows, and mom's pretty sure that it's time for this eagle to get out of the nest, the mother eagle starts to do a very interesting thing. Each day, she starts to pull from the nest the grass and the feathers and the leaves. And after a few days, home is real uncomfortable for the eaglets. <laughs> and they find themselves on these sharp sticks, and they're getting all uncomfortable. Gee, mom, this isn't like it used to be. What a bummer home is. You mean I've got to clean my room now and do all this stuff? Well, when mom is satisfied they're pretty uptight about home, she does another interesting thing. She puts her wing over this nest, and she says something audibly to the eaglets. And if we could understand eagle talk, she probably says, get off the briars onto the wing. Because these two baby eaglets then scramble up on the wing. And here they are in this great, soft place again. And they kind of nestle down into those feathers, and they're loving that. And just then, without any warning, Mom dives out of the nest. And these eagles grab onto her feathers for dear life, and she flies out over the countryside. And, you know, they start getting a little confident, and they look down, boy, this is great, look at that. <laughs> and they're going out over the countryside. And then Mom starts to circle up. And she goes higher and higher and higher. And she gets way up there. And these baby eaglets are just loving this ride. And then without any notice whatsoever, mom turns upside down and shakes them off. And these two baby eaglets come screaming out of the sky. They don't know how to fly yet. And they're tumbling head over wing, screaming bloody murder. And then mom does what the naturalists refer to as a miracle of nature. She swoops down and catches them before they hit the ground. Now, if you saw Superman, you know that's possible. <laughs> she comes down and she grabs those eagles. Well, when those eagles find themselves back on the wing, boy, they are petrified. They're wide-eyed, and they go, and what does Mom do? She starts to circle back up. Well, they know what's coming now. They're hanging on for dear life. She gets up there and does the same thing, shakes them off, and they come screaming out of the sky a second time. Mom swoops down about the third time. These eaglets are screaming out of the sky, and they see Mom sweep by with those magnificent wings, and they say to themselves, you know, I have two of those. Why don't I use them? And pretty soon, whew, those new wings go out, and they fly. And then they're off on their own. And they never come home again after that. And they go back and they do the exact same thing. You know why? Because they know how. They've been taught well. You know, in a very real sense, that's kind of what happens to us. We get dropped until we discover our wings. And a lot of us come screaming out of the sky just like that baby eagle. And we see great men and women around us who have the wings of faith and courage and all of those other things. 
And finally we begin to say, you know, I think I can do that too. Why don't I try? And then one of those trips out of the sky, we find ourselves putting the wings out, and we're flying too, just like the eagle. Now the second story builds on the first. And this story, you've probably heard this, is a story of a naturalist who was walking by a farm on one occasion, and he looked into the chicken coop, and there amongst the chickens was a large eagle. The farmer on one occasion had found this giant egg, and he put it in with the chickens, and he thought it was a funny looking chicken, but it, it was raised as a chicken. And so the naturalist comes to the farmer, and he says, you know, you got an eagle out there with your chickens. He says, no, I don't have any eagles, just chickens. Well, come here, I want to show you, you got an eagle out there. And he takes him out and he says, that is an eagle. No, that's a chicken. No, I know what eagles look like. Have you ever seen a chicken with an eight-foot wingspan? That's an eagle. No, that's a chicken. I'll prove to you it's an eagle. And so the naturalist takes this eagle and he puts him up on the fence post of the farm and he points the eagle's head towards the sun and he whispers in its ear and says, you are an eagle. Fly. The eagle looks up the sun, he looks back at the chickens, and he jumps off the fence and goes back and scratches with the chicken. The farmer said, hey, I tell you, that's a chicken. And he said, no, that's an eagle. And he said, tomorrow I'll prove it. So the next day he comes back and he takes this eagle up on the weather vane of the barn. And he says to the eagle, you are an eagle. Fly. And he points his head to the sun. The eagle looks up at the sun, looks back at the chickens, jumps down off the weather vane, goes back to the chicken. The farmer says, I'm really sorry, but that's a chicken. The national says, no, that's an eagle. Tomorrow I'll prove it's an eagle. So the next day he came. They took the eagle up to a high mountain. Couldn't see the barnyard anymore. And he put him out on the edge of a cliff. And he pointed this eagle's head at the sun. And he said, you are an eagle. Fly. This old eagle looked up at the sun. And he looked around. And he spread his wings. And he flew. He flew out over the countryside and never came back. The naturalist looked at the farmer and said, that is an eagle. Now, brothers and sisters, I share that with you because everyone in this room was born an eagle. But unfortunately, many of us have been raised in the chicken coop. And I'm not talking about your homes, and please don't be offended by that. <laughs> but we have been raised to believe that we are chickens, and we live like chickens because we, we grow up with them. And everybody around us are chickens, therefore I better be a chicken. Don't want to be an eagle and embarrass anybody. But someday we get the vision of who we are and we start to fly with the eagle. Now, brothers and sisters, once we get that vision of who we are, sons and daughters of God, when the Lord appeared to Moses, he said three magnificent things. He introduced himself by saying, I am God. Number two, he said, Thou, Moses, art my son. He identified the relationship. And then third, he said, and I have work for you. Is there anything Moses couldn't do knowing that? We know the same thing. He is God. We are his sons and daughters. He has work for us. Is there anything we can't do knowing that, young people? Why do we keep ourselves in the chicken yard? Now, I'd like to take you through a a timeline of events, if I may, and do this very quickly, to build a case for who I believe you are. Now, I'd like you to, if, you have, if you're writing, which is great, draw a line across your sheet of paper, and we're going to go from this end of this podium all the way over to there. And on this end, we're going to say, that's the year zero. All right? And on this end of the podium, we're going to say, this is the year 1830. And I want to give you some historical events that took place in this period of time, and I want you to ask yourself as we go through this, why me now in 1981? In the year zero, as we do our calendar now, we know the Savior was born, all right? Let's come up 30 years, that's about four inches up on this thing. In the year 30 AD, the Savior did his thing. We know that he had his ministry at that point. He created a church. He selected apostles and leaders and organized a physical organization. Three years later, because they didn't like that organization or what he was teaching, he was rejected. And the classic form of rejection in those days was crucifixion. And so he was crucified. Between the year 33 A.D. and 96 A.D., 
the charter of the apostles was to what? Go throughout the world and build up the church. What happened to the apostles in those 60 years? You remember? They were all killed, save John the Revelator, and they were killed in some pretty ugly ways. Peter, for example, died in Rome. Peter was crucified, and he didn't feel worthy to be crucified the same way the Savior was, and so he asked if they would mind turning him upside down. They graciously accommodated him and crucified him upside down. All of the apostles died in similar ugly ways. In 96 AD, John the Revelator was banished where? To the Isle of Patmos. He wrote the book of Revelations there, and then we have no more knowledge of John the Revelator. At least the world didn't until the restoration of the gospel. All right, between 96 AD, and come up about six more inches on your timeline, and 320 AD, what was the plight of the Christians? What happened to the Christians? Okay, they weren't very popular for most of that time. They went underground. In Rome, you hear the history of the catacombs and the being fodder for the lions and the lion's dens, and the gladiators had great fun with them. But over about a hundred-year period, the philosophy and concepts of Christianity started to take hold as well as people could remember. And in the year 320 A.D., a man by the name of Constantine decided to have a meeting. And so he called some of the brilliant scholars of his time together. Constantine, the emperor, a very powerful man, had some unique challenges in bringing his nation empire together. And so he got these wise men, and he sent them to a place called Nicaea. And he said, I want you to go out there and have a meeting, and I want you to come back and tell me what God is like. Nobody can really tell me what God is like. And I've got to know. And when you come back and tell me, that's the way everybody's going to believe in God. You understand? You bet. So they went to Nicaea and they had a meeting for several weeks. At the end of that meeting, they came back with a statement on God, which has become known as the Nicene Creed. How many of you have read the Nicene Creed? I really encourage you all to read this. What it says, in essence, is that God, Christ, and the Holy Ghost are all the same person. They're not really a person of flesh and bone and blood and that sort of thing, but they're the same. They're not really the same, but they're sort of the same, so in as much as they're sort of the same, they're the same. And that's the way it reads. And we find the formal beginnings of the Catholic Church. We also find the beginnings in that era of the reign of the popes back here. In 785 A.D., come up another six or eight inches on your timeline, there was a second Nicene Council held. This was under the Empress Irene. In this Nicene Council, it was determined that they would canonize saints. And the worship of saints came into the religion. If we come from 785, come up now to about 900 A.D., somewhere in here, and you won't find this taught anywhere in the Catholic Church, but the Lutherans feel that they have documented proof. At one point, there was a woman pope. There was also one era where there were three popes, all believing that they were the only true and living pope and warring one with another to prove who they were. The reign of the popes, brothers and sisters, was not a religiously tolerant period of time. More people were killed in the name of Christianity between 320 A.D. and the late 1800s than all of our wars put together. In 1200 A.D., come up to about here on your timeline now, we had an interesting pope by the name of Innocent III, Pope Innocent III. The reason he was significant, and he was known as the boss pope, and he had several wars that he was trying to finance, a very powerful emperor, king, pope, all wrapped in one. Because he was having difficulty financing his wars, he introduced into the church a principle called the sale of indulgences. Who can tell me what the sale of indulgences is? Well, it's a unique program of where you can pay for the remission of your sins. In other words, you go out and have a great time Saturday night, and then Sunday come in and you confess your sins, pay X number of dollars, and it's gone. In fact, in later years, you could even prepay sin. <laughs> great program. I've tried to sell this to several bishops, but they won't buy it. 
budget program. Well, he raised a lot of money for his wars. Now, the reason this principle is significant historically is what happened 300 years later. Also in 1200 AD, we have the invention and appearance of the printing press. You need to know that between the time of Christ and 1300 AD, very few people read. In fact, it was considered a sin to read. There are some parts of the world where as late as 1957, Catholics were not allowed to read the scriptures. In 1300 AD, let's come right up to the pulpit now, a revolution took place in Europe. Not a revolution of war, steel and that sort of thing, but a different kind of revolution. What was that? The Renaissance. The Renaissance was an age of enlightenment, a cultural revolution. People for the first time started to read because there was material now as a result of the printing press, things they'd never read before. People began to question things they had never questioned before. Come over here now to the left side of the pulpit. In 1492, what happened? Boy, you better know that. <laughs> Columbus showed up. And up until this point, the world believed that, the people in the world believed that the world was flat. And Columbus came along and said, you know, I, th I think it's round. Oh, you're a heretic. World's flat. Look, you can see the edge right out there. And he said, no, I think it's round. He was a product of the Renaissance. And he conned somebody into giving him three boats, and he got in these boats, and he disappeared. Everybody came down to the pier and watched him go off the edge and say, there he goes, poor guy. And he sank off the edge. Well, much to their dismay, a few months later, he came back. He said, you know what, guys? The world's round. No question about it. In 1515, we'll go just to this side of the pulpit now on our timeline. Another product of the revolution appeared on the horizon by the name of Martin Luther. Martin Luther was a Catholic priest, not a rabble-rouser, not one trying to destroy the church, but a faithful, good Catholic priest. And because of the Renaissance and the ability now to read ancient scriptures, he went back and read some of the original documents. And the principle that bothered him the most was the sale of indulgences. And he said, I can't find anywhere in the ancient writings that says anything about the sale of indulgences. I don't think that's right. And he developed 95 questions that he wanted answered by the church. And he nailed these questions to the church at Wittenberg, Germany. And after several weeks, that's, you know, that program really doesn't get around all that fast. People wander by and, you know, well, here's something from Martin Luther, whoever he is. But after several weeks and months, these questions caused a terrific furor in Europe. And because of these questions, Luther was called before several courts of the Catholic Church. And they said, Luther, you've got to stop this. No more questions. You better stop it or you're going to be in big trouble. He said, I'm not trying to destroy the church. All I want is answers to my questions. They would not answer them. And in 1823, excuse me, 1523, a little farther down, he was excommunicated from the church. And the Catholic Church decreed, because they had the right and power to do it, that it would not be considered murder to kill Martin Luther. In fact, you would be doing the church a favor if you would do away with him. Well, this is a classic form of rejection, too. And Martin Luther had to go underground, which he did. A number of people believed what he was saying, and they approached him, wealthy people of Germany, and said, will you head up a church? We think you're right. And for a long time, Luther said, no, I don't want to head up a church. That's not why I'm doing this. I love the Catholic Church. But when they started trying to kill him, he decided he would, and so he reluctantly accepted the role as the first leader of the Lutheran, what is now the Lutheran Church. Never did he claim any revelation. Never did he say, thus saith the Lord, because I've talked to him. All he said was, I've got some questions. Things don't seem to be right. And with Martin Luther began a major period in European history that we know as the Reformation. So here we have now, 1523, the Reformation really gets going. In 1534, a little farther down that timeline, Henry VIII over in England was having some marriage trouble. Remember Henry VIII, interesting guy. And he says, I want to get rid of my wife. 
And so he went to the Pope and said, I want to get rid of my wife. And said, no, that's not part of the program, Henry VIII. And he says, well, I'll tell you what, Luther's doing okay over there. I'm going to do it too. And he broke with the Catholic Church and created the Church of England. What is the Church of England in America today? The Episcopal Church. Okay, that's the beginnings. Now, no revelation, no formal experience with God. Great way to solve marriage problems. In 1540, we have another reformer surfaced by the name of John Calvin. John Calvin comes on the scene in the Switzerland, France area, and he says, you know, I think Luther's right. There's a lot of things that I don't buy that he says, but I think he's on the right track. And Calvin starts the Huguenot program. Who are the Huguenots in America today? You know who the Huguenots are? Presbyterians, okay? In 1560, another John, John Knox, over in England, comes on. He is a disciple of Calvin and Luther. And he says, I think those guys are right. I don't agree with everything they're saying, but I think they're on the right track. And he started the Puritan movement. Great reformer. In 1575, now we're out to about here, to give you a flavor of how the reformers, the, the atmosphere in which the reformers were laboring, an experience occurred in Paris, France, that we know today as Bartholomew Day. Bartholomew Day is when the Catholics rose up and slaughtered hundreds of Protestants, reformers. They said, you know, we had enough of this stuff. We don't want to hear about this reforming junk anymore. And they slaughtered them in the streets. That was the flavor of the Reformation. That was not an isolated incident. Because of this kind of thing, what happened in 1620, just about 40 years later? Historically, what did the Puritans do in 1620? They got on boats and they said, we've had it with this stuff here. We're going over to this place Columbus found where we can believe the way we want to believe. And so they left and they went over to Boston. Now, were the Puritans a religiously tolerant group? No, they weren't. They were almost as bad as the people over in Europe. But they did recognize they had to allow that freedom to people that wanted it. And so they simply said, you can believe the way you want, but you believe our way if you want to live in Boston. And that's how all the other towns got started, because they wanted to believe the way they wanted. Between 1620 and 1776, we find the birth of a magnificent nation. People saying, you know, I, there, there are a lot of things that aren't right around us, and I want to believe the way I want to believe. And get off our backs, King George. Now I'm paraphrasing the Declaration of Independence just a little bit. <laughs> but he said, get off our backs, King George. We don't want any more of this stuff. We want to be on our own. And we went into a war with England. And by some miracle, and brothers and sisters, if you study the Revolutionary War, it is a very real miracle. By some miracle, we won that war. We beat the British. We weren't supposed to. We embarrassed the British. And a new nation was born. What happened in 1805, about 20 years later? Joseph Smith was born. We come out here now. Joseph Smith was born. What happened in 1812? A significant war took place. The War of 1812. That's very good. <laughs> what color was George Washington's white horse? It was black. <laughs> The War of 1812 took place. Why was that significant? Because we beat the British soundly this time. They came back and said, you know, you embarrassed us a few years ago. And we don't like that. And they rode up the Potomac River in their boats. They shelled the White House and burned it to the ground. But this time we had a navy. We had our own boat. The USS Constitution was commissioned in, in 1797. Beautiful boat. We had an army. We had a navy. And this time we beat them well. And we said to the world, don't mess with us anymore. We're on our own. We have our own ability to protect ourselves. Don't mess with us anymore. And we had written what is that was then and is today, if we had stopped messing with it, a divine document called the United States Constitution, which guaranteed the freedom of religion. What happened in 1820? The first vision. God and Jesus Christ appeared to the young boy prophet, Joseph Smith. Look what the Lord had to do through inspiration to prepare a people that could withstand a visitation from him. Suppose, brothers and sisters, that Joseph Smith had arrived back here in 1100 A.D. And he'd come to the world and said, you know what? 
I just talked to God and Jesus Christ. Can you believe that? You want to know what he had to say? What would have happened to Joseph Smith? He would have been killed so fast, he probably wouldn't have been able to say it twice for heresy. He just didn't do that then. But now the Lord had prepared a nation, and he didn't wait very long. I think the Lord is pretty excited about that whole chain of events, and he couldn't wait to get Joseph Smith down here. What happened in 1830? Now we're clear out on the other end. The church was organized, officially became the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Do you know what else happened in 1830 in Washington, D.C.? The United States Congress closed the U.S. Patent Office. And in the congressional record you can read from 1830, we are closing the United States Patent Office because in our opinion, everything has been invented that could possibly be invented. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Well, I want you to know they have reopened it since. <laughs> Why the progress since 1830? Is this some chance? Did this happen just by chance? Why everything since 1830 that has occurred? In these brief 150 years, over the last 2,000, incredible progress in every field, from medicine to data processing. Why? Because Revelation is back, I believe. Why? Because the Lord, once again, is speaking to prophets on the earth. You know what a significant event happened in 1817, just a few years before the Restoration? Do you know who was born in 1817? Karl Marx. Isn't that interesting? The opposition. Heavy opposition. Who's winning numerically today? Karl Marx. No question about it. Now, brothers and sisters, I want you to ask yourself the question. As you look back over this entire period of time, why me now? Why was I born when I was born? I assume you were born probably in 1960, somewhere around then. Why in 1960? Why wasn't I born in Vladivostok, Russia in 933 A.D.? Have you ever really asked yourself that question? I want to tell you, I believe you were born now because you were somebody before. On one occasion here in Salt Lake City many years ago, a man, not a general authority, was speaking at a fireside like this to young adults. And President McKay, then the president of the church, was sitting in the audience. That would be an interesting experience to talk to the prophet sitting there. You really want to make sure you're straight with what you say. And he got carried away with the spirit, and he proceeded to say the following. He said, I'm inspired to tell you tonight, young people, that in the pre-existence, you served as captains and generals in the war in heaven before the world was. Boy, that really had an impact. I thought, gee, I'm a captain, I'm a general. Wasn't that great? <laughs> and then he went on with his talk, and as he finished his talk, he really started to get very nervous, and he thought, boy, oh boy, here's President McKay sitting there. What have I done? So as soon as he got through, the meeting was over, he grabbed President McKay, and he said, look, I, you know, I really got carried away up there at night. I'm a little embarrassed. Said, you know, was, I, was I out in left field? Did I make a mistake tonight? And President McKay looked at him and said, uh, well, yeah, I actually did. There weren't any captains. He said, oh, well, I feel better about that. <laughs> I believe it's because who you are. Joseph Smith on one occasion said, if I were to tell you who I really was, you'd slay me for blasphemy. Did you know he said that? Yeah, he knew who he was. He was smart enough not to tell him. But he knew who he was before. Why now? If we're going to soar with the eagles, we've got to learn how. How is it done, brothers and sisters? We must develop a thing called faith. Faith in God. Faith in ourselves. Knowing that we can do it. How is faith developed? Faith is developed by mastering celestial habits. When missionaries come, how many of you are returned missionaries just for my interest? Wow. When we come into the mission field, we start studying the gospel like we never studied it before. We have an interesting experience in the church called a missionary farewell. Have you ever been to a missionary farewell? It's an interesting experience. In that meeting, the war doesn't sit the way they normally sit. The primary teachers, seminary, Sunday school all sit on the first three rows. And while the prelude music is being played, a very interesting conversation is taking place. Really, or a primary teacher will turn to a Sunday school teacher and say, Can you believe this? 
John's going on a mission. No, I can't believe this. That's why I'm sitting on the first row. Look at him. He's got ears. I haven't seen his ears for years. <laughs> and then the meeting starts, and Mom gets up, and Moms are like this in farewells, and they carry on forever. And I'm grateful my mother's here tonight, and she did that at my farewell, too. She carries on, and she gives maybe John four minutes at the end, and so he gets up and bears a nervous testimony, and he disappears for two years. At the end of the two years, we have another ceremony in the church called the Missionary Homecoming. You ever been to one of those? Same people sit in the first three rows. Same conversation. Can you believe this? The gospel must be true after all. Look at John. And instead of the red in his cheeks, he's got little lines at the edge of his eyes, and his hair is not quite as full as it used to be. And he has a whole different look about him. He's changed. He's become different. Instead of a four-minute nervous testimony, this time he stands up and speaks for 40 and the bishop has to ask him to sit down because another <laughs> ward needs to come in. And we go away from that experience and we say, isn't that neat what the mission did for John? Wow. Changed. You know what's about the change? Two basic disciplines. He discovered when he got into the mission field that because he was the captain of the football team at home didn't make any difference. Because the cheerleaders were slitting their wrists over him didn't make any difference. <laughs> If he was going to succeed in this business, he needed the spirit. He needed to learn to listen to that spirit and identify it. And so he mastered two disciplines. He studied the scriptures every day like he'd never done before. And then he prayed every day like he had never done before. You know how many times a missionary and his companion will pray together in a day? Seven to eight times on their knees, minimum. Ask yourselves, you return missionaries, how often did you kneel yesterday or Friday? At the end of each missionary's mission, I had over 600 missionaries in my mission. I had an interview with each one as I sat with them, and I have several of my missionaries here, both men and women. And I would commit them to continue studying the scriptures every day, not reading the books, and there are a lot of books, all the brethren write books for some reason when... Brethren made general authorities, they have to write a book. And so we have hundreds of books, and they're great. But they're not the headwaters, they're downstream. The headwaters are the scriptures. And I commit them to read these scriptures, and they say, You bet, President Smith, I'll do it. I also commit them to say their prayers every day, often, as often as they did in the mission field. And the reaction was always the same. They were dumbfounded that I would even ask them that question. Well, President Smith, that's easy. Of course I'm going to do that. Are you going to do it, Ellen? Yes, I'll do it. Two or three times I'll get them to say, yes, I'll do it. And then we come home. And we get through with the mission reunion and the mission homecoming. And what happens then? Then I hear missionaries say, boy, I miss the spirit in the mission field. And when I hear that statement, a great big flag goes up in my mind. And I say, why? Why, Elder, do you miss the spirit in the mission field? Well, I don't know. You studying the scriptures? Well, sort of. Sort of is missionary language or military language for I haven't touched my scripture since I left the mission field. Are you praying often every day? Well, yeah. How many times yesterday? Well, gee, you know, before I went to bed last night. And we turn off the spigot. It's just like turning off a hose. We get used to this flow of the spirit and we come home and instead of five or six and eight times on our knees, it's once quickly before we go to bed at night, maybe if we get in bed on time. Instead of studying the scriptures two hours every day, it's 20 minutes before priesthood meeting if we have to teach a class, but then we carry them because it makes us look great and everybody thinks we're studying. <laughs> and of course, they're all marked up because we marked them in the mission field. We haven't marked anything since we got home, but we open it up and everybody says, wow, look, how he's marked his scripture. <laughs> but we stop doing it and the spirit stops communicating and we do lose that spirit. As I have talked to a number of my missionaries that have had trouble since they got home, invariably the questions were not answered very well on those two issues. Let me share this poem with you. I am your constant companion. I am your greatest helper or your heaviest burden. I will push you onward or drag you down to failure. I am completely at your command. Half the things you do you might just as well turn over to me, and I will be able to do them quickly and correctly. I am easily managed. You must merely be firm with me. Show me exactly how you want something done, and after a few lessons, I will do it automatically. 
I am the servant of all great men and the last of all failures as well. Those who are great, I have made great. Those who are failures, I have made failures. I am not a machine, though I work with all the precision of a machine, plus the intelligence of a man. You may run me for profit or run me for ruin. It makes no difference to me. Take me, train me, be firm with me, and I will put the world at your feet. Be easy with me, and I will destroy you. Who am I? I am heaven. Will you let that sink in for just a moment, brothers and sisters? The celestial habits that save, that give us the ability to listen to, identify, and respond to the promptings of the Holy Spirit come from some very basic, simple discipline. Disciplines we've heard about all our lives to the point where we know, I know all that stuff already, and we back away. My young people, the Lord has you here today because he needs a people of great faith. We are facing a time in this country economically and in the world politically where you had better have a testimony of your own or you're not going to make it. It's that simple. I just close with one story about faith and, and the power of faith. I've told this story, I'm sure, to my missionaries, but Maybe not. When we arrived in the mission field three years ago, we had been here just a few days, and our mission, we opened a new mission, and so we didn't have any furniture in our office. We didn't have a telephone, so we had to use the telephone out in the hall. And after we'd been there just a few days, a missionary called me on the phone, and we had one of our missionaries listen for the phone. They always wondered what this suited guy was sitting out by the payphone in the lobby. And he came in and said, President Smith, there's an elder on the phone. So I went out and he said, uh, President Smith, you don't know me yet, and I really don't know you yet. But he said, I need to go home. And I said, gee, maybe we better talk about that. And he said, yeah, I think we better. It's important that uh, I talk to you because it's important that I go home right away. Well, he had about a half an hour drive to make it into the mission home, and I started to think to myself, boy, what am I going to say to this kid? I've been here three days, and I'm supposed to save all my missionaries. And I'd made a commitment while I was going through the MTC experience for mission presence, that I wasn't going to lose any of my missionaries. My ego got involved, and I said, you know, I hear about all these missionaries that fall away, but boy, I'm not going to lose any. They haven't had me yet. <laughs> well, I matured over that three years. We lost it more than I'd like to think about. But this elder came in, and he proceeded to tell me the following story. He said, President Smith, I'm a convert to the church. I've been a member of the church for three years. I've been in the mission field 18 months. My father is not a member of the church and a severe alcoholic. My mother is not a member of the church. My brother, who is 14, large in stature for his age, is having a very serious drug problem and beats my mother regularly. My father beats my mother regularly. And in the last 18 months, my mother has called me at least weekly, usually more often, and begged me to come home. It used to be my role at home to protect my mother from my father and brother. And he said, I just got a call last night from my mother. My father came home drunk, had lost all their money again, and severely beaten my mother. My brother participated in the beating, and she was very badly bruised and injured. And she said that she had purchased a weapon, and that if I did not come home tomorrow, that she was going to kill herself. She was going to commit suicide. And he said, I really think I ought to go home. Well, as I sat there and listened to this story, I thought to myself, boy, if I have heard a good reason for going home from a mission... I've just heard it. And I find myself wanting to say, Elder, I'll take you to the airport myself. I'll buy your ticket. I'll get a Learjet and fly you home personally if we have to. We've got to get you home. And after you got through telling this story, it was my turn to talk. And I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing myself say. And I said to him, I said, Elder, you know, I, said, I don't suppose I've ever heard a more practical, real opportunity to exercise faith than what I've heard just now. I said, do you suppose the Lord wants you to finish your mission? Yeah, I'm sure he does. How about President Kimball? Yeah, he does too. Your bishops take president? Yeah. How about me? Yeah, I'm sure you do. How about you, Elder? Do you want to finish your mission? President Smith, I'd love to be able to finish my mission. But I can't. And I said, do you suppose if we put this in the hands of the Lord that he could take care of that? And he just sat there and looked at me for a while. 
Well, he was thinking about that. I said, I'll tell you what, Elder, before he responded, let me go call your mother and just see how things are. So I went out to our pay phone and I called his mother. He was from Florida. And I got a very distraught woman on the phone and she said something like this, Mr. Smith, I don't know who you are. <clears throat> and I don't know anything about this Mormon mission thing, but I'm telling you now, if my son isn't home tomorrow, I'm going to kill myself. I have purchased a weapon, as she described as a large caliber handgun. I'm going to do it. I can't take it anymore. And then she hung up. Well, I had a long walk from that telephone back into my office. Because all the other feelings came back. Get him home, President Smith. Just get him home. So I went back in the office and I looked at him. He was sitting there with a very intense look on his face. And I said, Elder, what do you think? Think the Lord can take care of this? Think faith is real? And we just kind of sat there in silence for a long time. And then he looked at me and he said, President Smith, if you tell me my mom will be okay, I'll stay. <sighs> <laughs> and I remember taking a big breath and I looked him in the eye and I said, Elder, She'll be okay. Okay, he said, I'll stay. He got up and shook, his, shook my hand and left, went back to his area. I went home that night and I had a very long night. I remember praying like I don't believe I've ever prayed before. And I've done some real pleading with the Lord in my life, but I found myself getting a little short with God. Did you hear what I said today, Lord? Did you hear what I promised this kid in your name today? You better back me up, Lord. <laughs> I don't suppose you ought to talk to the Lord like that, but I was a little uptight. And the next day, I went back to the office, and every time that phone rang, I could hear somebody telling me that there'd been a death in Florida. My faith wasn't all that strong. But the phone call never came, and somehow, through a very real miracle, things got better. Things got better. When that elder finally went home, we had our little experience as we did with all the missionaries. He came into my office and he sat down and we just kind of looked at each other for a while. A sweet experience. You had one of those experiences where the spirit was just so thick, there just wasn't anything right to say. We just kind of sat there and basked in this feeling together for a few moments. And then I kind of looked at him and I said, Elder, faith works, doesn't it? He said, yeah. Yeah, President Smith, works. I have a testimony there. And we kind of hugged each other and he left. I haven't seen him since. I want to bear my testimony to you, young people. Faith is no joke. It's real. Mountains get moved by faith. It is by faith you can discover who you are. It is by faith that you can discover what you can be. An eagle, not a chicken. I have a testimony and a faith in who you are. I hope you have that same vision. If you can get that vision and realize really who you are, things will occur in your life that others will refer to as miracles. But you'll know it because you've mastered the principle of faith. I bear my witness the gospel is true. Jesus Christ lives. He is the Son of God. That is for real. And I bear that testimony humbly in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.